Coming up, the war on faith. Everywhere in China, there is intense persecution of Christians. Pastors are being arrested. Churches are being attacked. Their crosses were being burnt, destroyed, destructed. And millions are being thrown into slave labor camps. Producing products for Apple, Nike, Costco. Can anything stop China's new crackdown? Maybe we should call President Xi Jinping as God's you know, faithful servant to revive his church. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Iran and the United States are locked in a face-off over an Iranian nuclear deal, and Israel is caught in the middle. How did Iran raise the stakes over the weekend? And how could this deadly stalemate reverberate throughout the Middle East? Chris Mitchell has an exclusive at Israel's northern border. Sunday, the head of the U.N. nuclear watchdog announced Iran will provide less access to its atomic program. The move is a response to U.S. refusal to lift sanctions, which Iran is demanding as a condition to return to the negotiating table. Some warn if negotiations lead to sanctions relief, it would begin a financial chain reaction in the region. If more money would go, to the IRGC, to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, it would mean more money for Hezbollah in Lebanon, more money for Hezbollah in Syria, or the uh, other uh, proxies of Iran in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, and more instability in general to the Middle East. You're already seeing Iran show tremendous aggression. It is increasing rapidly its enrichment of uh, uranium, now to high level enrichments that, you know, very, very close to bomb making capacity. Middle East observer Joel Rosenberg fears negotiations could force Israel to strike first. That with Biden trying to get back into the nuclear deal, Israel might decide it has to take preemptive military action against Iran's nuclear facilities. And then what would be Iran's counterpunch? Almost certainly it would be by ordering the Hezbollah military to fire its 150,000 or so missiles and rockets here at Israel, which would be devastating. A war of words has already begun on Israel's northern border. Israel's defense minister, Benny Gantz, declared Lebanon's ground would tremble if Hezbollah attacked, while Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah boasted his military can hit anywhere in Israel and that Israel would not see anything like it since the founding of the state. Just days ago, Israel's Air Force launched an exercise that simulated 3,000 strikes on Hezbollah targets within 24 hours. That's a great capability, and it's a message to Hezbollah. We know where you are, and we will get you. Israel's military predicted in 2021 that Hezbollah does not want to enter into a full-scale war. But in 2006, the second Lebanon war began with a small ambush. So they know anything could happen here on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Here in the north, every small match can uh, fuel a huge explosion. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Thanks, Chris. I've been looking for Ezekiel 38 to come to pass, and it's getting, it's heating up. You see, here's the uh, fundamental belief in those um, uh, Iranian people. The twelfth Imam will come, and when he comes, the world will be in chaos, and he will put an end to the chaos. Then he will be acknowledged as the supreme uh, representative of God, and even Jesus is supposed, to, under their thinking, will acknowledge him, the twelfth Imam. Now that's the the the, the thinking, but before he comes. There will be utter de uh, devastation. <clears throat> so they would not mind us incinerating all of Israel. They wouldn't mind, mind having uh, 50 million uh, casualties if that would bring about the coming of the 12th Imam. I mean, it's crazy, but that's what they believe. So Israel has an absolute right because if the Iranians get the bomb, they have said clearly they will use it against Israel. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, keep your eyes open, your, your ears tuned for what might happen. But what might very well happen is a war over in that area, and it's going to take the Lord himself to put an end to it. Well, in other news, 500,000. That's the deadly toll of coronavirus deaths that the U.S. expected to reach today. And despite this tragic number, what hope is on the horizon? John Jessup reports. Pat, the United States hits that 500,000 lives lost mile marker before the end of the day. That's nearly the population of the city of Atlanta. President Joe Biden holds a White House ceremony remembering the loss this evening. Despite that tragic number, though, there is some encouraging news. New cases dropping by 73 percent. Hospitalizations also down more than 50 percent in deaths also falling. Efforts are ramping up after the winter storms delayed 6 million vaccines. Still, there are more concerns over the South African variant, which may be more resistant. If in fact this becomes more dominant, we may have to get a version of the vaccine that is directed specifically against the South African isolate. Dr. Fauci also predicted Americans might need to keep wearing masks until 2022. Well, down in Texas, it's starting to warm up after last week's deadly winter weather. Although the storm might be over, serious problems remain. Dale Hurd explains. Texas may have thawed out, but millions of residents are dealing with a serious water shortage. And some are seeing sky-high electric bills. Houston's boil water advisory has been lifted, but an estimated 10 million Texans are still without safe drinking water. The good news, full power is expected to be restored to the state today. I suspect that all power will be fully restored across the state of Texas to every house. The bad news, some are getting astronomical electric bills, one as high as $17,000 after a spike in the energy market. You know, you're being held hostage and you can't do anything about it. How in the world can anyone pay that? The governor announced a moratorium on utilities disconnecting service if a customer can't pay their electric or water, and he's looking into ways to reduce those bills. But many Texans remain outraged at being without electricity for seven days. It's ridiculous, and it's unacceptable, and it's a failure on so many levels and on so many individuals. Many homes have also been ruined by burst pipes. Texas power providers are also facing a $100 million lawsuit from the family of 11-year-old Christian Pavone. They claim their son died of hypothermia after they lost electricity in their mobile home. And across the South, residents in many hospitals are facing a water shortage. And as you see, no running water at all. The White House has issued a disaster declaration for 77 Texas counties. Governor Abbott called it an important first step, but is asking for it to be expanded to the entire state. Operation Blessings Hunger Strike Force has been busy, delivering truckloads of water to Texas residents through several churches. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Pat, a lot of people still, still in serious need of relief. It's unbelievable. It's not just in Texas. It's going up, I understand, in Memphis, Tennessee. The airport was closed, so they're having problems in Tennessee and other parts of the South. It's really been a, a disaster. Uh, well, Operation Blessing is operating, as we showed. Our hunger strike force is busy delivering pallets of uh, bottled water in Houston, Beaumont, and Cleveland, Texas. And um, again, if you want to help, uh, the, the just it's it's the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, and uh, I know you you say, well, I'm warm and you've got water. Well, that's good for you. Well, think of the people in Texas and in Tennessee and in other parts of the South that are suffering. So if you want to help, just call in and say you can count on me. Well, there's more controversy coming out of Washington. It just seems there's a radical group taking charge, and, and we were seized by what looks like some kind of a uh, pathos that is intent on destroying this nation. Let's see what John has about that one. 
Well, Pat, Congress is considering a controversial bill this week designed to overhaul the nation's civil rights laws to include LGBTQ Americans. Opponents of what's called the Equality Act argue that it tramples on the rights of women and people of faith. CBN's Jennifer Wishon reports. Under the Equality Act, disagreement is discrimination. It includes gay marriage, men competing in women's sports, and doctors performing procedures like gender reassignments that go against their conscience. It's a bill the president wants to sign into law during his first 100 days. The Equality Act provides long overdue federal civil rights protections for LGBTQ plus Americans, preventing discrimination in our housing, education, public services and lending systems, the president tweeted. But the bill does much more. We can see that it would immediately be um, stripping religious Americans and stripping girls and women of our equal rights. By redefining sex discrimination, the measure would provide for abortion on demand, likely end a long-standing prohibition on taxpayer-funded abortions, and remove conscience protections for doctors and nurses. Biological men would be allowed to compete in women's sports, effectively obliterating Title IX, while girls and women would be forced to share locker rooms and bathrooms in schools and public places. Harley says we don't have to guess about the results. Just look at cities and states that have already passed similar laws. In Alaska, the city of Anchorage had a law like this and punished a faith-based homeless shelter for battered women and actually forced them to allow biological men who identified as women to sleep and change clothes alongside these women, um, most of whom were victims of rape and sex trafficking. She says the Equality Act allows for subjectivity, an issue Senator James Langford raised last summer on the Senate floor. If I go to interview in a job and I'm not hired, I can sue that employer because I perceive they were thinking I was gay and so they didn't hire me. I don't have to prove anything. It's based simply on my perception or belief. Under the bill, Christian beliefs are unlawful. Churches could be prevented from requiring employees to abide by their biblical beliefs about marriage and differences between men and women. Alliance Defending Freedom is litigating a case in Virginia, a state that recently passed a law like the Equality Act. Churches are banned from having a dress code having a code of conduct for their employees, even asking in interviews if em potential employees share core religious beliefs. Harley and others opposed to the legislation say tolerance must be a two-way street. I think the Equality Act p treats people of faith as second-class citizens. It, you know, it specifies a certain point of view and it labels it as bigotry. Speaker Pelosi wants a vote in the House this week where it's expected to pass overwhelmingly. It will need 60 votes in the evenly divided Senate. At least one Democrat opposes it, and it's unclear how many Republicans might support it. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Some important religious freedom concerns. Pat, back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's like there's a massive fight against you. And uh, as I have said many times before, the devil always overreaches. This is an overreach that the people don't want. And I think that the idea that, uh, for example, a homeless shelter is going to be sued if it doesn't allow for men and women to share the same facilities, and women who've been raped or in the presence of rapists and, and child molesters and so forth, this is horrible. And having men complete in women's sports, horrible. I mean, biological men are just stronger than biological women. It's just the way it is. Their muscles are made that way. And to have them compete, it would put the end to women's sports. But that's what they're trying to get at. So what's the big deal? I mean, the uh, LGBTQ sort of thing. Now we're going to have to pay for sex changes. And that's going to be something that will be in health care. And doctors who don't want to perform it or will, they can be sued and put in jail. I mean, this kind of stuff, we've got to stop. And people have got to stand up and say, we can't take this anymore. If you don't stand up, then those rights are going to be taken away from you. 
If we do stand up, the devil will shrink away. Resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. You've got to resist them, and that means you've got to vote, and you've got to insist on your rights to your congressman, congresswoman, whoever is in, in positions of authority. Let them know your feeling. Don't just sit by idly and let this stuff go through. Terry? Well, coming up, churches burned and desecrated, pastors detained and imprisoned, and genocide against ethnic Muslims. What's behind this major crackdown in China? And why is it being reviled as the, quote, stain of the century? Then later on, meet a world champion bullfighter. Why is this cowboy laser focused on the bull's eyes? And how did he earn the nickname Fearless Frank? You'll see for yourself, that's coming up. Your news channel, your shows, the stories you care about. Anytime you want, anywhere you want. Download the CBN News app today. We want to hear your story. Send us a message or call us 1-800-700-7000. Tomorrow, a young man is gunned down in broad daylight, guilty of being black. He heard Travis Michael make the statement. The mother of Ahmed Arbery speaks out on her son's murder. I didn't realize hate was that close to where I was raising my kids. Plus... A member of Pandora's Billionaires Club and the artist behind one of the most streamed rock songs of all time. Skillet's John Cooper tells the truth on tomorrow's 700 Club. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Uh, in our thrust to make peace with China, we cannot allow some of the things that they're doing to be swept under the rug. We cannot allow it. Churches burned, destroyed, and desecrated. Believers hunted down for worshiping with family members in their own homes. Catholics kicked out of their houses for refusing to remove religious icons. The current government of China's extreme crackdown on Christians and genocide against ethnic Muslims has been called, quote, the stain of the century. Gary Lane brings us this alarming report. February 1st, 2021. Public security police storm onto the property of a government-sanctioned church in China's Wenzhou City. Their mission? Toppling a cross from the roof of a church building for a second time. They'd removed the cross seven years earlier, but church members replaced it. Bob Fu is with China Aid, a group that helps China's persecuted Christians. That city alone, we have documented over 1,600 churches with their crosses were being burnt, destroyed, and destructed. And many pastors, you know, were even detained, imprisoned. China's Christians say it's the worst persecution against them since Chairman Mao Zedong. To use ambassador. Uh, 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 Sam Brombeck's word uh, is a war against the faith. I think it's a war against the independent faith. And it's no longer limited to certain regions of China. VOM's Todd Nettleton says this massive wave of Christian persecution is widespread, and it's coming from the national government. What we say in 2021 is that everywhere in China, there is intense persecution of Christians. There is intense uh, efforts to control the church, to bring the church under Communist Party control. The crackdown is affecting every Christian in China, says Nettleton. Protestants, Catholics, government registered churches and unregistered house churches. And the Chinese Communist Party has a new excuse for targeting Christians. Now, under this the pretext of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, um, the Chinese Communist Party has intensified its persecution by banning all the church activities, even those services or worship uh, or prayer meetings in believers' own homes uh, with their own family members. July 22, 2020, a loud knock on the door at the home of a woman in China's Yaman City. 
She tells the police outside they cannot enter her home without a permit. Moments later, they destroy the lock and enter anyway, breaking up what the government says is an illegal meeting. Fu says it's all part of President Xi Jinping's campaign of sinicization, which means Christians are only considered to be good citizens if they adhere to communist ideology. Ironically, Xi Jinping's portrait was even put on the church pulpit along with the Chairman Mao. And uh, the first line uh, item of worship, um, uh, you know, uh, by the government sanctioned church before COVID-19 uh, was to sing a Communist Party's national anthem. And examples go beyond churches. In Fuzhou City, a Catholic family was forced out of their government subsidized housing after they refused to remove religious icons from their home. And China's Religious Affairs Bureau has banned religious funeral ceremonies and preaching in funeral places. Meanwhile, Christians aren't the only ones suffering. Ethnic Uyghurs from East Turkestan, a region the communist government calls Xinjiang province, are under attack. China is home to one of the worst human rights crises of our time. It is truly the stain of the century. One day before he left his post as U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo officially announced that China is committing genocide against the Uyghurs and Turkic people. New Secretary of State Antony Blinken supports the genocide designation. For years, the Chinese government has forced Uyghur women to undergo abortions and forced sterilizations. Twitter recently locked the account of the Chinese embassy in Washington for tweeting that Uyghur women had been emancipated from being, quote, baby-making machines. The U.S. Defense Department says as many as three million Uyghurs are being forcibly detained in re-education and forced labor camps. The president of East Turkestan's government in exile told me on the global lane that China is using the camps as a place to brainwash the Uyghurs and harvest their organs for profit. And he says detainees are being used as slave labor. Millions are still, um, you know, working in slave labor factories, producing, you know, products for uh, companies like Apple, Nike, Costco, and uh, dozens of others. And Uyghurs are reportedly being used to manufacture solar panels for export to the U.S. and elsewhere. The Chinese government calls it a poverty reduction effort. The U.S. State Department is alerting corporate CEOs and others about China's use of Uyghur slave labor so they won't become involved. Meanwhile, despite the suffering, Bob Fu is expressing optimism about the country's spiritual future. He says when the Communist Party seized government control in 1947, only about one million people in China claimed to be Christian. But today, after 70 years of unrelenting persecution, their numbers have grown to as many as 130 million. So I think uh, at the end of the day, maybe we should call President Xi Jinping as God's you know, faithful servant to revive his church. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, you know, I had hoped it looked like it was going to come to pass, uh, say, 10 or 15 years ago, that China was going to be the largest Christian nation on the face of the earth. And when I was there with the Three Self Church Movement and others, I'd preached in a church uh, in uh, Beijing. It was jammed with people. It was just glorious. I mean, really glorious. And uh, I, I, I thought there was nothing but a, a bright future ahead for China because of that. And yet, this come in with this Xi Jinping, who is just an absolute monster. And what he's doing is outrageous. But still, the Lord's church, uh, what does they say? The blood of the martyrs is the seedbed of the church. And they are suffering like we cannot believe, but they are going to prevail. And the communists know when they fight God, they, their arms are just too short to box with God. God's going to take them out. It's just a question of how soon. Terry? Well, still ahead, a Monday round of your questions and Pat's honest answers. Taylor says, my mother-in-law is critical of my husband, and she has never been supportive of him or anything to do with our family for the past 22 years. Any advice? That's going to tell it like it is. That's coming up. But first, he's the only thing standing between the bull and almost certain death for the rider. This world-class rodeo rescuer makes a living saving lives. So what happened when the champion needed saving himself? Find out after this.
Do you have questions about God? Call us. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000 or check out this link. This Easter, spend time reflecting on Jesus' final week. In CBN's free devotional, The Hope for Redemption, you'll follow his path to Jerusalem, observe his last Passover meal, gain insight to his agony at Gethsemane, witness his crucifixion, and encounter the empty tomb. This Easter, realize afresh that he is risen. Get your free copy today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Easter devotional. I don't know about you, but I'm always looking for something special at major spiritual holidays that will help me really prepare my heart and my mind, kind of get away from the chaos of day to day. And we have something to help you do that for Easter. You can spend time reflecting on Jesus' final week with this free devotional. The hope for redemption illuminates Jesus' path to Jerusalem, his last Passover meal, his agony at Gethsemane, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. If you'd like to get your free copy of this Easter devotional, all you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit cbn.com slash Easter devotional, and we will gladly send you one. I think it will enhance your Easter this year. Pat? Okay. Well, switching from Easter to bullfighting, <laughs> going head to head with a raging bull and cheating death time and time again. That's how Frank Newsom earned the name Fearless Frank. Frank is a champion bullfighter, rescuing rodeo riders when they're thrown off the bulls. So what happened when Frank needed to be rescued himself? Take a look. It's the life of a rodeo bullfighter, but lived on Frank Newsom's terms. I don't have to worry if something was to happen to me, whether it was on the way here or while I'm here. Our medical team, they've put me back together so many times over the years. But then decides to roll over Frank Newsom. The tough rescuer nicknamed Fearless Frank has learned to manage his deepest fears. I know the confidence I have in my savior and my salvation is key to that. Just knowing that Jesus, he's got this, you know, he's got me. Between competitions in the arena, Frank reflects on his role. We're a worker, we're a servant, you know, we're a protector. Our job is to keep the guys safe. It's about knowing if you got your job done or not, and knowing about your teammates, the guy next to you, if, if everybody's working together. When Ryder is ready, Frank's bullseye is clear. The bull is your main focus point. Where he's gonna go, his speed, his momentum. You see their eyes, you see if they're looking around, it's kind of an intensity there that you can feel, you know, anticipating what they're doing. You're taking control or, or looking for that control over the bull, but we're seeing the rider body language of when he's gonna come off and where he's gonna land. Frank Newsom has to come in and be the blocker to make sure Junio doesn't get run over. I grew up around cattle, working with my dad, working on different ranches. We would buck bulls after we worked, and some of the older guys were trying to teach us how to ride bulls. And we would take turns saving each other, and man, I just knew that was my spot. Being an overwhelming feeling, you know, that, man, I'm gonna devote my life to this. This is, this is me right here. Frank's career took off quickly, winning both national and world finals in just his second professional season. There was so much more freedom in what we do as rodeoing and bull riding than I was ever used to growing up. I was good at what I did, so I, I, I made money. And with it came distraction. Probably way immature for the success I was getting as far as how to handle that. I know I was. I wanted to be the best, but then bad habits just kept creeping in and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The rodeo's traveling pace and the bullfighter's pain led to Frank's growing substance abuse and addiction. Once I allowed them drugs into my life, I mean, things just got way wilder and you're not sleeping, but you're going to all these bull ridings and rodeos and you're getting your bodies beat up, you're drinking more. I just couldn't see in the moment how my addiction was tearing my life apart. And you're still having success. I got this, I can handle this, you know? Until Frank's private struggle caught up with him. You know, I got pulled over, I was way out of hand, driving way too fast, just just being really reckless, getting thrown in jail, you know, having to face that and having the consequences come down on me. You know, I needed that. 
Instead of competing in the Bull Riders 2000 finals, Frank was alone in jail. I owed people money. I owed time, you know, for laws I broke. I had broken relationships. All the things that I grew up knowing that were important, man, I trashed them due to sin, just letting sin control me. Hitting rock bottom, it was Frank's turn to be rescued. So he prayed. And I was just like, this is reality. How did it get like this? The first step of truly wanting Jesus into my life, you know, it wasn't no more about getting out of trouble. Lord, I need you. I need you, Lord. I've, I've made a mess of things. And he knew that and he was there. After losing his career, Frank rebuilt his reputation. I had to go back to the very bottom and work my way back up in the arena as a bullfighter, but also in life and gain trust day by day with people. Since 2005, Fearless Frank has restored his place among the bullfighting greats as a well-respected competitor and mentor. My motivation is not just about me doing my profession, but it's like, man, if I can save this guy's life, maybe that's one more day that gives him an opportunity to be saved, that he can spend eternity in heaven. He can go home to his wife and kids and, and lead them in a good direction. Trust the Lord right now without having to hit rock bottom. Trust him right now. Let him be your master. Let him be who he is. What a great testimony. Boy, what a profession, by the way. Spend your life. I mean, how re risky. I mean, that is one risky deal to have a mad bull coming after you. Yeah, it takes your breath away just yeah. watching it. Well, anyhow, <laughs> he, he's, he's with the Lord. and I'm very delighted, but that, that's something really terrific. All right, we've got some questions. We do. You ready? This is Taylor right, who go. says, my mother-in-law is critical of my husband, and she has never been supportive of him or anything to do with our family for the past 22 years. She doesn't even treat our children like her other grandchildren. She and my father-in-law get hostile and angry with words and actions. I believe in respecting your parents, but when is enough enough? Any advice? Oh. Well, the Bible says have nothing to do with an angry man. It sounds like there's a lot of anger in that family. You see, she's your mother-in-law, which means she's your father's, your wife, your husband's mother. mother yeah. But she doesn't like him either. That's kind of weird. But uh, I, you don't have to be subject to abuse. Uh, you know, the idea is you honor your mother and father, but uh, you give weight to their decisions. But you don't have to be under the f thumb of abuse all the time. And you don't have to expose yourself to it. So you say, what's my advice? Well, my advice is, you know, honor them if you want to, but stay away. Have nothing to do with an angry man. It'll just upset you. And why argue with them? It's not going to win anyhow. So just love them and get on with your life. Okay, this is Amy Pat, who says, I have prayed for God to take away my withdrawals from meth and to help me. I don't know what to do. Will I go to hell for my addiction to meth? Uh, no, you don't go to hell because of your addiction to meth. You go to hell because of your sin. And um, if you're sinning, then what you need to do is to come to the Lord and let him save you. As far as an addiction, uh, you know, ask him to help you. But I'm a great believer in that idea of 21 days. If you can say, today I'm not going to take that stuff, then today I'm, I'm not going to take it, then today I'm not going to take it, today I'm not going to take it. And for 21 days before long, your body will have gotten free of some of the problems and you, you will be free from it. But I mean, just it, it's going to take day by day by day. You don't use it, period. All right. This is Greg who says, since I accepted the Lord a few years ago, tears come to my eyes when I'm watching spiritual movies, when someone is praying with me, and when I'm thinking of helping others in need. Is this the Holy Spirit? I'm a big, strong guy. <laughs> Actually, the tears that come uh, from loving the Lord, I mean, you may be strong, but you sure aren't as strong as the Lord Jesus, and you're not as strong as the Holy Spirit. And the fact that your heart is still tender toward God is a wonderful thing. So don't fight it. You know, th there's, there's nothing unmanly about having tears in your eyes. This is Will who says, Hi, Pat. Last summer, I began growing closer to God and reading my Bible. I want to know, despite my past, how long does it take for God to forgive me and accept me? I want to be born again, but I'm not sure how. What should I do? Uh, I don't understand uh, what you, in order to be born again, you've got to repent of your sins. And you've got to say, I, 
you know, the idea, the ter Greek term is metanoia. I have a, uh, I'm going this way, and now I'm turning and going this way. And the minute you make that decision and say, I'm going to turn my life over to Jesus, and I'm going to stop sinning, and I'm going to give my life to Him, uh, at that moment, His Spirit will come upon you. And uh, from that moment on, uh, if you have really repented, you have been born again. You have accepted Him. So uh, that's you, you. Once that is done, you need to begin to thank Him for what He's done and to begin to live it, and then read the Bible and nourish your spirit with prayer and Bible study and all the other things. But th that's where you start. All right. Melissa says, my boyfriend has not asked me to marry him. We currently have two children. I've tried to get him to understand the importance of marriage to me, but he just says he's not ready. I love him, and I just don't know what to do. Should I walk away from this relationship? Um, look, I, I don't know you, and I hate to give advice to somebody I'm not able to see. But um, you say you're in a relationship, and you had children, but you're having sex, and you're not married. Um, that in itself is something that's wrong. So your boyfriend doesn't want to get married. Well, why not? I mean, does he really, uh, as they say, he, he wants to have the milk without owning the cow? I mean, he, he doesn't want to take responsibility for you. He doesn't want to take responsibility. You know, the thing that people do, they don't understand when they're in their 30s, that sooner or later they get older. And, you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than I have been. But when you get that way, you sure you need people to love and support you. You need a family. And um, the idea that you have a hookup here, there, and the other place, uh, you know, you need that. And he needs to make a commitment. And if you don't, he won't make a commitment, I think I'd walk away from it. This is Sandra who says, I have a family member that owes us quite a bit of money. We're retired, living on fixed income, and struggle daily in financial matters. They are now two years behind in paying us a dime. Every time we ask, they come up with some excuse. Am I being unchristian and selfish by asking for this money to be paid back as promised? Uh, you, you're not really, but I, I think there's some things you're better off just writing off. And you've loaned these people some money, and they're defaulting on the loan. So what do you do? <clears throat> well, the Bible says, "Suffer yourselves to be defrauded." Uh, you, you've been, you've been had, but why keep bringing it up? You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, either you've got to sue them and, and force them to pay the money, which you don't really want to do. And uh, look, God has the gold and the silver and the cattle on the thousand hills. He can replace that debt 10 times without any strain at all. So why don't you begin to look to him and say, God, how will you want me to get ahead? And I'm going to begin look for something to do in my life that will bring back the money I need. I will write the thing off and forget it. I mean, really, that's, I mean, why let that thing keep agonizing? You're not going to get it paid off, so just write it off, all right? Yes. Good okay. idea. <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And thank you. Well, still ahead, a woman is sidelined by agonizing pain. So why did she refuse to see a doctor? And how did that lead to a supernatural remedy she never saw coming? Find out. That's coming up. A story has inspired the world for thousands of years. While well, some scholars doubted his very existence. We are sharing some light on the story of David and Goliath. This is ancient, biblical Jerusalem. CBN Films presents, written in stone, House of David. Extraordinary discoveries made headlines around the world. Written in stone, House of David. Get your DVD copy for a gift of any dollar amount. Do you want to know more about having a relationship with God? Call us at 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN Newsbreak. Boeing is recommending grounding some of its 777 aircraft after an engine started coming apart during a flight out of Denver Saturday. The FAA says two fans on the plane's right engine failed shortly after takeoff 
Passengers seeing this frightening sight, flames and debris fell midair as eyewitnesses watched in shock and horror. The pilot made an emergency landing, fortunately, with no injuries reported. Well, despite the political unrest in Myanmar, CBN is providing Superbook resources for churches through an online Sunday school training program. Due to COVID-19, the Superbook team is providing monthly training, teacher training through Zoom. In January, it focused on enhancing creativity and nurturing children with behavior behavior issues. More than 150 teachers from nine regions took part in the program to encourage and equip them for service in children's ministry. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. We don't know what the future holds for different tech companies. But we always want to be able to share the good news through the media. So I want to invite you to watch our program on CBNFamily.com or download the CBN Family app. This way you can have direct access to the 700 Club and other specials from CBN, and you won't miss a thing. Now just click below to get more details and watch with us. Trapped in the dark with no way out. That's how a single mother in Thailand felt when the COVID pandemic shut down her business and confined her to her home. She and her daughter were all alone with no one to ask for help. So how did they find a way out? Well, take a look. A short time before COVID-19 hit Thailand, Ploy lost her job. As a single mom, she didn't know how she would provide for her six-year-old daughter. That was the first time CBN's Orphan's Promise stepped in to help. We gave her equipment and supplies to start a business selling food in front of her house. The business changed our lives. I made more than $20 a day, enough for rent, food, and my daughter's school fees. Then the pandemic hit, and Ploy was forced to stop selling prepared food. The government said all businesses had to shut down. People could not leave their homes. I couldn't sell any food. We were all alone. It was the worst moment of my life. There was no one to ask for help. I felt like I was trapped in the dark, and I couldn't find a way out. That's when Orphan's Promise came back to Ploy's community. This time, we brought food packs filled with rice, eggs, noodles, fish, and milk. We also gave them hand cleaner and face masks. My daughter said, look, Mom, they've come to help us. We've got food. I thought, we're saved. After the government eased the shutdown, we also provided capital for her to buy food and other supplies to restart her business. Business is better than ever. My daughter never goes hungry, and I'm saving part of my income again. I'm also able to share food with my neighbors. You helped us and brought us joy. Thank you. Just want to say thank you as well because you know in so many countries around the world when there is some kind of a disaster when people are in need there's no system to come to their aid i mean it's every man every woman every child for themselves one of the reasons orphans promise is doing this kind of work is to keep moms like ploy or other parents from putting their children in orphanages you know, you made it possible for them to stay together. You made it possible for them to have food. You brought them the gift of hope. And boy, you can't put a price tag on that, can you? That's if you're a 700 Club member that you did all of this. We say thank you to you. If you're not a 700 Club member, I hope you can see the opportunity you have to make a difference in the lives of people who have extreme need. And I want you to know that, that People who join the 700 Club are doing this every day all around the world. So join with us. Be a part of this. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. 
even the number to join is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say you want to join. There are lots of club levels you can join at. So call and let us know what you feel you want to do on a monthly basis. And we welcome you to making a difference. Not only welcome you, we say thank you by sending you Pat's latest book called I Have Walked with the Living God. You're going to love this. In fact, CDS, who lives in Lakeland, Florida, said, I'm reading I Have Walked with the Living God now. I find it's well written with godly facts. It's good to know Pat's beginnings and not just his beginnings, but the faithfulness of God yeah, yeah. all along the way in the journey. That's what we want you to know. And so this is our gift to you when you call and join today. Pat. Thank you. A super long needle. Oh, it sounds scary. That's what Julia Bratcher knew the doctor would use to draw fluid from her swollen knee. So Julia said, no way you're going to stick that thing in my knee. And the pain, though, became agonizing. So how did Julia find a remedy without leaving her living room? Watch this. At 72 years old, Julia Bratcher is still going strong. She works in a hospital cafeteria and loves to cook. I make all the salads, parfait cups, fruit cups. I do bacon, I do muffins, I do danishes. I have to go in the freezer and get all those products out. I'm on my feet from the time I go to work in the morning until I walk out. And I like interacting with the people that come in the cafeteria. It's just a fun place to be. We all work together as a family. But in early April of 2019, her left knee started bothering her. I had to go buy one knee brace and I put that on and it got still got worse. So I went and bought another knee brace and put it on. And for over a month, I had to wear both knee braces in order to do anything. I could only do my job, come home, take a shower, go, lay down, and recruit to go back to work for the next day. That's all I could do. Julia's new insurance didn't start for three more months, so she wanted to wait until then to see a doctor. But there was another reason she put it off. A few years back, Julia had fluid drawn from her other knee, and she wanted to avoid repeating that painful experience. I knew how long the needle was. <laughs> it's pretty long. And when I had it done that one time, I said, Jesus, I don't never want to have this done again. Julia used over-the-counter remedies to deal with the swelling and pain. I wouldn't say I was getting depressed, but I was really getting frustrated. I talked to a girl at work, Lisa. I would say, Lisa, I'm gonna just trust God on this because I really don't want to go and have this fluid drawn off. I'm just gonna trust God. On Memorial Day that year, Julia worked a full shift that left her knee exceptionally painful and swollen. As always, when she got home, she turned on the 700 Club to lift her spirits. I was just watching it like I always do, and Gordon said, Someone else with problems with your left knee and just incredible fluid buildup, and the, the knee just literally doubles in size, and you've got to get it drained. And God is healing you. He's just making restoration of that entire joint. In Jesus' name, receive it now. And I said, that's for me. And I laid my hands on my left knee, and I said, oh, Jesus, 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 thank you, thank you. The pain left, and soon the swelling was gone as well. Julia says she hasn't needed pain meds or a knee brace ever since. This has been a good opportunity to let people know that Jesus is alive and real today. After this healing of my left knee, all I know to say to anybody, go to the Father and ask Him for what you want. Believe it and just trust and it will come to pass. That's it. You don't need the long needle. You just need the power of God. Julia's got the answer. Here's something that happened to Renee, who lived in Bloomfield, Indiana. She suffered for 14 years for a fracture. She fell from a roof. And uh, Renee was watching this program February the 5th of this year. And Terry prayed that somebody, I don't know what the condition is, but it creates instability in your ankles and feet and putting shoes on the channel. 
you'll feel warmth and come into your feet and you're going up in the calf and it strengthens you. And Re Renee said, that's me. And the next thing you know, she's got restful sleep and it's all completely healed. All right. Well, listen to this. This is Helen. She's writing by email from Lagos, Nigeria. Yeah. Praise God. I want to testify that God healed me on Monday, February 8th, 2021. On the program, Pat pay prayed for someone with arthritis of the hand. And to my surprise, God healed me. God bless you all. So what a wonderful surprise, wouldn't yeah, it be? From Lagos, <laughs> Lagos, Nigeria. Look, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And we're going to believe God for you. I, I, Terry and I are going to join hands. We're going to trust God. And I'll ask you at this point of time that you uh, suspend your disbelief, if you will, and say, yes, God, I'll, I'll take it. Father, we pray together right now. We know there are people in this audience. There's, there's a guy named Michael. You're coughing up blood. And uh, uh, it's, it's tuberculosis. And, you know, that's something that we thought we'd done away with. But you've got this thing. And, and, and God is going to be like a breath of, 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 of cold air coming into your lungs right now. Just breathe deeply. Cough again, and you're completely healed. Uh, Terry. Now, there's someone else. This is a cough as well, but it's not because you know what you have. It's just sort of chronic and annoying. It's always there. You haven't been to a doctor to see what's causing it. You have an underlying concern. But right now, in the name of Jesus, just receive your healing. That cough is gone. The tickle's gone. The irritation in your throat is gone. Breathe freely. Oh. Um. You have, again, we saw somebody with a knee. Um, put your hand on your left knee, and there's a, there's a, a, a buildup of, of, of arthritis, and uh, the, the joints aren't working properly, and you thought you might have to have a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. But uh, I believe the name's Billy. You are healed. Put your hand on it, and you'll feel heat in that knee. In the name of Jesus, touch him. And someone else, you've had a gastric bypass that has left you with all kinds of recurring problems, and you're so discouraged. Nothing seems to be able to set you free from this. But right now, in Jesus' name, receive your healing completely from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. Thank you, Lord. Uh, th there's a, a, a demo. You, you're, you're swelling up all over you. you. I don't know what's, what's causing this thing, but you, you have... You're just swelling, and you say, God, what's going on in my life? You've, you've actually cried out to God and said, please help me. And uh, the, Nigel, I believe it is, in the name of Jesus, be made whole. That fluid will leave your body, and you will be completely healed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, that's all the time we've got. Please give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. We'd like to hear the answers to prayer. We want your prayer requests, whatever. 1-800-700-7000. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Colossians. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. It's all the time we've got. Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.